In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, please send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and our minds so that we can know you better and love you more. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. All my young Padawans, I am your Jedi Master. I'll be teaching you Jedi mind tricks this morning. Uh we had some terms at the end of lesson eight. With Without looking at your notes, I'm going to quiz you a little bit. Let's see. Let's go back to last week. What's the word for all-knowing? Starts with an O. Omniscient. Good job. What's the word for all-powerful? Starts with an O. Omnipotent. Very good. Omnipotent. Uh, present everywhere starts with an O. Omnipresent. Very good. This is a tough one. All loving starts with an O. Omniscient. Nope. That's all knowing. Omnibenevolent. Benevolent is not a word that I think you kids use very often. And um, what is a word that means that God cannot change? He, he is unchanging. Starts with an I. Is it imminent? Nope. That mean imminent means God is very close. He's within. He's within you. Unchanging, immutable, immutable, and um, what did God say to Moses at the burning bush when Moses said, what's your name, Lord? I am. I am. What does that mean, I am? It just means he is. He was the first person. He, he ever, is. He, he exists. Is always, he just always will be. Always has been, always will be. He is existence. God was just telling Moses one of his attributes there, that he is existence, and he gives existence to everything that does exist. God is existence from God, who is existence. All right, that's a little bit of a review. Here we go, lesson number nine. Number one, you should have your notes out and you can follow. I keep mine in a three-ring binder. It makes it very easy. The Blessed Trinity is the greatest mystery and the most important doctrine of Christianity. Yeah, it tells us who God is. What could be more important than that? If you're going to have a religion that worships God, you have to know who that God is. And the doctrine of the Trinity tells us who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is what we call a strict mystery. Doesn't matter how smart you are, you can never figure it out. You could never have come to this conclusion using only your intellect, only your reasoning ability. To know that there's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what did we need? What did we need? Two words. We've had this before. We've had this before. Divine revelation. Divine revelation. God had to reveal it to us. And God did reveal it to us most perfectly through Jesus, who came to the earth, and he talked about his Heavenly Father, and he talked about the Holy Spirit, and of course, he talked about himself, and so Jesus revealed to us that there are three distinct persons, but there's only one God. There is only one God. Oh, let's review those words. 
What is the word for one God? Belief in one God. Monotheistic. Monotheistic or monotheism and many gods. The word for that? Polytheistic. Polytheistic. And everybody on earth were polytheists until who? The Jews. Who started the Jews? Abraham. Abraham, that's right. He's the father of our faith. You know, we say that in, in Mass, every time at Mass in Eucharistic prayer number one, it mentions Abraham, the father of our faith. He is the first person in recorded history uh, to believe in the one true God. So, uh, number two, the divine persons do not share one divinity among themselves, but each of them is God, whole, and entire. What does that mean? It's not like the Father is one-third of God, and the Son is one-third of God, and the Holy Spirit is one-third of God. No, no. That'd be like taking a pie and you cut the pie into three pieces. Each piece is one third of the whole. You have one pie and each piece is one third. That is not what we believe. You get this kids? No, that's not what we believe. That would be the error or heresy called partialism. That the Father is only part of God. The Son is only part of God. The Holy Spirit is only part of God. Nope, that is not what we believe. We believe, and again, your mind cannot grasp this. You cannot understand this fully. We can accept it because God has revealed it to us. We can accept it on faith, but we cannot totally comprehend this. It goes beyond our the ability of our minds to do so. And what I'm saying is, that the Father is completely God. The Son is completely God. The Holy Spirit is completely God. Each one is God, whole and entire. So they're not one third of God. Okay, that would be partialism. Another error is called modalism. That would be saying that the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are really only one person, but they act in different modes. For example, I am a father of children. I am a husband to a wife and I am a son to my parents. And uh, so I'm only one person though, but I'm acting in three different modes as father, as a son, as a husband. Or maybe a guy is a husband and he's a teacher and he's a soccer player, you know. He has he acts in different modes. That's not what we believe. Okay? That is not what we believe. The father is distinct from the son. The father is not the son, and the son is not the Holy Spirit. They are distinct persons, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. That's why we call it a mystery, guys. This is what God has revealed to us. So we don't believe in modalism. We don't believe in partialism. Each person is distinct from the other person. 
Uh, number four, it is the Father who generates, the Son who is begotten, and the Holy Spirit who proceeds. When Jesus revealed to us the Father and the Holy Spirit in a very specific way, Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. It's that word begotten. You probably don't know what it means. It's not a word that's used very much. But what does it mean? Begotten refers to the male part of human reproduction. The father begets the child. The mother gives birth to the child. The father and the mother both participate in this new child's coming to life. But the father plants the seed, so to speak, and the mother gives birth. The male part of reproduction is called begetting, and so the child is begotten by the father. What's the other way of becoming a child of someone? It's called adoption. A child could be adopted into a family, and then that child is a son or a daughter of the parents, but they were adopted. When we say that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, and we say that in the creed, don't we? We say he's the only begotten Son of God. What we're saying is that Jesus is naturally God. He's not just designated as God. He is God. Whereas in baptism, you and me, we became children of God. Did you know that? I, I hope you know that. In baptism, we become children of God, a child of God. Not naturally, but we are adopted. God chooses us to become his children, and in baptism, he gives us sanctifying grace, which is the life of God in our soul. So we are the adopted children of God, but Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He is the only natural Son of God. Mary, when she became pregnant with Jesus, became pregnant by the power of God, not by the power of Joseph, her husband, but by the power of God. So Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And so we take the three persons of the Trinity, and because we're trying to use our human minds, we give them um, what the church calls missions. They each have their own mission, the Father, Son, and Spirit. They each have their own work that they do. And this is going to be a little complicated, and you just got to stick with me till I get it all finished. The Father generates. The Son is begotten. And the Holy Spirit proceeds. The Holy Spirit is sent into the hearts of the faithful by the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit into the world. So the Father generates the Son. The Son is begotten by the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Number five, inseparable in what they are, the divine persons are also inseparable in what they do. Oh, this gets very complicated 
because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. We are monotheist. We only believe in one God. The three persons, although they are distinct, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. They are distinct persons, but yet they do everything together. We don't always speak that way. We, we talk about the Father being the Creator. We talk about the Son being the Redeemer, that He died on the cross and, and redeemed us. We talk about the Holy Spirit as the giver of life who lives in our souls and gives us spiritual life. But the thing is, all three persons created everything. All three persons redeemed our souls. Not just Jesus. The Father and the Spirit were right there with him, redeeming the world. And it's not just the Holy Spirit that lives in us. The Holy Trinity lives in our soul. So even though they are distinct, and we often speak as if one person is doing something, technically, we believe that all three persons are inseparable and they do everything together. Okay, It's kind of a technical theological point, but we want you to have that. So we got a couple of vocabulary words here. A word, number one, means of the same substance, if two things are the same substance. And we use this word in the Nicene Creed. And we say it every Sunday. It's consubstantial. C-O-N-S-U-B-S-T-A-N-T-I-A-L. Consubstantial of the same substance. And let's just go to number two, what someone or something actually is. The word for that is substance. We could use other words like nature or essence, but we're going to use the word substance. S-U-B-S-T-A-N-C-E, -E, substance. And then consubstantial of the same substance. So, and I'm going to explain this more later when we get into explaining more about the, the Nicene Creed. But whatever the Father is, that's what the Son is. We say the Father is Spirit. Well, the Son is Spirit and the Holy Spirit is Spirit. Whatever their substance is, whatever they actually are, all three are the same thing. There have been people in the history of the world, for example, a priest named Arius in the early 300s in Egypt. He got the idea that Jesus was not God. He was not a divine person. And this priest started teaching everybody that the Father was God and Jesus was something else. He was something lower than God. He was higher than humans, but he was lower than God. And so Arius said they weren't the same substance. But that's not what we believe. And we had the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And at that ecumenical council, that's where we get the, the Nicene Creed from, the first part of it. And the bishops of that council made it very clear. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Arius said Jesus had been created. Begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. So the bishops are making it very clear. He's the, the Son is the same substance as the Father, not the same person. They are distinct persons. 
but they are the same substance. Whatever the Father is, that's what the Son is, and that's what the Spirit is. As human beings, we can't even grasp what the substance of the Father is or the Son. It's beyond us, you know. We, we can't understand these things. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in everything. They are equal. So why do we put the Father first? Well, if you have three things, you got to have them in, you got to put them in some order, okay? And so we say the Father is the first person of the Trinity. The Son is the second person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit is the third person. Is the first person more important than the third person? No. Is the second person more important than the third person? No. It's simply we have three things, and so we have to list them somehow. Okay? They are all equal. We worship and we adore the Father. We worship and we adore the Son. We worship and we adore the Holy Spirit. They are equally God, and yet there are three distinct persons. Okay, that's lesson nine. Now lesson 10. Number one, Scripture reveals God the Father to be the Father of the second person of the Blessed Trinity creator of the world, and merciful father of all humanity. This is kind of how we speak about God the Father. We, a lot of times, refer to him as the creator. Like in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So the, what we say about the Father a lot is creation. But technically, Jesus created the world just as much as the Father did. And the Holy Spirit created the world just as much as the Father did. Number two, Scripture reveals God the Son to be one with the Father, the Redeemer of the world, and the one who revealed the personal and imminent nature of God. In the, in the New Testament... We see in the Gospels, we see Jesus saying that the Father and I are one. Jesus says to Philip at the Last Supper, Philip says, show us the Father, Jesus. Jesus says, Philip, I've been with you for three years, and you still don't understand. When you see me, you see the Father. The Father and I are one. This is such a mystery, kids. We, you know, we, you know, it, it's, if you said that you were one with your dad, <laughs> we'd say, you're crazy. <laughs> your dad is a distinct person and you are a distinct person. And the God, the father is distinct and God, the son is, a, they are distinct persons. And yet Jesus could say, when you see me, you see the Father. And when you hear me, you hear the Father. Jesus said, I only, I only speak what I hear the Father say. So it is very mysterious. Jesus is the Redeemer of the world. Jesus comes into our world, taking on a human nature so that he can live and die shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And that is how he redeemed us. I don't know if you know what that word redeem means. The word redeem means to buy back. We sin. Somebody has to pay the price. What's the price for sin? Death. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. The price for sin is death. Somebody's got to die. And God, in his mercy, says, I know you're under the death penalty, 
but I don't want you to have to pay the price. God took on a human nature, and since Jesus was sinless, and he didn't have to die for his own sins, he could offer his life as payment for all the sins of the world. And that's what he did. That's how he redeemed us. And Jesus reveals to us, it's an amazing thing. Jesus reveals to us that God is Father. You know, the ancient people 2,000 years ago, the ancient Romans and the Greeks and stuff, they did not see God. First of all, they had many gods. They were polytheists. And their gods were far away. And their gods were not personal. Their gods were like mean and angry. And if you did something wrong, they're going to throw a thunderbolt at you or something. And Jesus reveals to us that the one true God is like a loving father. In fact, Jesus uses the word Abba, which most translators say was really like Papa or Daddy. It would be the term that a small child would use for their father. That's, that's wild. God, almighty God who knows everything, who's all powerful, who creates the whole world, is my daddy? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's very cool. And I'm very glad that God is such a, who doesn't love their papa? You know, that is, that's very cool. And Jesus reveals to it, reveals to all the whole world that that's, that's who God is and that God is imminent. God is not just out there. We've had that word already. Who knows that word? That, that word that means God is beyond everything in existence. He's beyond. Eternal. What? Eternal. Nope. That's no beginning and no end is eternal. Infinite. God is, what? Infinite. No, that's unlimited. This word means that God is outside of space and time. He's outside of everything that's existed. Starts with a T. God is. Timeless. No. Got Trans it. Transcendent. There you go, Jack. Transcendent. That's the word that means he's completely separate from every created thing. He is transcendent. And that is true. But God is also imminent. God lives in us. If you're in the state of grace, the Holy Trinity is living in you. Jesus said this over and over. Let me give you, uh, in your textbook, there was a quote. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, from um, uh, Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus says, if you love me, I will make my home. I will live in you. In another place, he said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you abide in me and I abide in you. That word abide, it means to dwell in. Do you know another word for your home? Starts with an A. probably a word you don't know. Have you ever heard of the word abode? It's, it's a different word for home. I live in my abode. I live in my home. And we have the word abide. It means to live in your house. You abide in your house. And Jesus said, if you receive me in Holy Communion, I will abide in you. I will live in you. 
you will be my home. Oh, man. That's amazing. That's totally amazing, people. That God lives in us. Wow. Number three, Scripture reveals God, the Holy Spirit, to be the highest gift of God who sanctifies the church and all humanity. Jesus told the apostles when he was going up into heaven, what do we call that? What's the word for that? When Jesus went up into heaven? The ascension. ascension. Very good. The ascension. Before he ascended into heaven, he told the apostles, wait and pray. He said, in a few days, you will receive the Holy Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses. They need the power of the Holy Spirit. And they prayed for nine days. And on the 10th day, the Holy Spirit came upon them in a very powerful way. We call that day Pentecost. And from that day on, the apostles had the courage they needed to witness to Jesus, to preach the gospel. They had the courage they needed to even be martyrs and die for the faith. They had uh, great powers to heal people and work miracles. And, and they had the, the motivation and the energy to go out and take the world by storm. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power of God in our lives today. And you should always be praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit because that's how you get the Holy Spirit, kids. Jesus, in Luke's gospel, Jesus said, you fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who... Need it? Nope. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who? Deserve it? No. Thanks for trying. Want it? No. Believe in him? No. You fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who? Ask. For it. Ask. Somebody said it. To those who ask. You got to ask. Jesus said, seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given to you. Knock and the door will be open to you. We have a free will. God has created us with a free will. And he waits for us to say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come to me, Holy Spirit. I want you. I want you to. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. <laughs> God is not rude. If Jesus came to your house today, do you think he would walk up to your front door, take his foot and just kick the door in? <laughs> if he came to your door what would he do knock he would knock or ring the doorbell he's not rude <laughs> he's not a bully the Holy Spirit is not going to force his way into your life we said that God wants to live in you like living in a, in a home well He's waiting for you to invite him in. God rings the doorbell. You look out the window. Has anybody ever come to your door? I guess they even have these doorbells now that have a camera in them. And, and like you can see who's out there. But sometimes, years ago, to make a living, uh, I didn't get paid much for being a teacher. And so I also had a second job where I sold life insurance. 
and I would uh, call up people and say, you know, uh, I, I'd like to come to your home and, and show you the products that our life insurance company has. And I would set up an appointment with them. And then maybe at six in the evening or seven in the evening, I would ring the doorbell and people, you know, I had an appointment with them and they would open up. Oh, hi, Henry, come on in. I don't know what was going on, but one evening I rang the doorbell and next to the door, there was a window and I saw the person, the lights were on inside the house and the person opened the curtain and they looked and they saw me standing on the porch with my briefcase and they shut the curtain and then they shut the porch light off. <laughs> they didn't unlock the door. They didn't want me to come in. You know, and I didn't go in that house, did I? I wasn't invited in. Well, what about you and the Holy Spirit? Are you going to invite the Holy Spirit in? Jesus told the apostles, pray. They prayed for nine days. For nine days. They prayed, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And on the 10th day, the Holy Spirit came in a very powerful way. Well, that's what I would suggest you do. When I was 21 years old, I had a conversion and I really gave my life to Jesus. I surrendered my life to Jesus and I prayed and prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came into my heart. And he's been living there ever since. And every day, I pray for the Holy Spirit to come in because Jesus said the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. He didn't say those who deserve it. He didn't say those who do awesome things. He didn't say those who feed the needy. He didn't say those who live a perfect life. No. He said he gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. You guys can all do that. You can all ask. So that's what I do every day, multiple times a day. I ask, Heavenly Father, please fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I can be a good witness, so that I can live this life. You know, kids, you can't follow Jesus. You can't live a holy life. You cannot do it, not on your own power. There are so many temptations from the world, the flesh, and the devil. On your own power, you're a sitting duck. You're toast. You're going to fall into sin. You need the power of God. You need God's power. And then with God's power, oh, then you can live a holy life. But only with God's power. So you got to pray for the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Yes, sirree. Number four, in contrast to the remote and transcendent relationship between God and his people in the old covenant, in the new covenant, the Trinity dwells in the soul of each baptized person. In the Old Testament, when we see God, we see him like on Mount Sinai. Moses goes up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, and it's described as the, the mountain is shaking. The mountain is having an earthquake. And the voice of God is like trumpet blast. And it says the, there was a fire. It was just blazing fire on top of the mountain. And there was smoke like the top of a volcano or something. And, the, and Moses had told the people, you stay down here. I'm going to go up there on the mountain to get, to get God's word. And he said, if anybody touches the mountain, you'll be struck dead. And so God was like out there and he was very powerful and very scary. When Moses came back down with the Ten Commandments later, the people said, don't ever, don't ever let God speak to us again. It's too frightening. <laughs> Well, that's kind of the way we see God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see God through Jesus. Wow.
he comes to the world as a as a little baby. That's not very scary. And then he lives among us and he heals us and he teaches us and he feeds us and he tells us God is our Papa. It's, it's a very different. Now, is what is the Old Testament wrong? No. God is all those things. But Jesus reveals God to us in a more full way, in a fuller way. You should, you should see God as your papa, as a loving father, as a loving dad. And I don't know about your dad, but my dad, he was very loving. He, was, he loved me. He was very nice and everything. But if I disobeyed him, he gave me a good whooping. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but we he would take a stick and he would beat you over the butt with it. And mom had a stick too. And she used that to paddle to spank the kids with. I don't know if you kids get spanked nowadays. A lot of parents don't do that nowadays, but now, but no. um, my my mom did. She broke the board over me, and I thought that was hilarious. And I started laughing, and boy, did she not like that. She grabbed another stick and really started beating me. Um, but uh, <laughs> you should have a healthy fear of God's punishment. Like, I fear hell very, very much exceedingly much you should it's eternal and it's worse than anything you can imagine but i also love god more than anything on earth and i know that he loves me and so there's a balance you know somebody shouldn't be totally scared of god all the time and on the other hand god is not the pillsbury doughboy that you poke him in the belly and he goes, Ew. <laughs> Who's the Pillsbury Doughboy? You never saw that commercial on television? Well, it used to be a very popular commercial on TV. Um, you'll just have to Google it, you know, Pillsbury Doughboy. And... Um, God is not a marshmallow. You can't just, you know, push him around. And a lot of people think that too. They think uh, they think everything's good. I can do whatever I want. Everybody's going to go to heaven. Doesn't matter what you do. It's not true at all. That's not what Jesus revealed at all. Sin must be really bad because look what Jesus had to do to save us. He had to be crucified. He was tortured horribly for our sins. So to save us, Jesus went through a lot of really tough stuff. So anyway, uh, there you go. That's lesson number 10. There's no vocab for that one. And uh, so that's 9, 10. Lesson number 11. After lesson 11, you will have uh, test number two. For those who are doing tests, after lesson 11 comes test number two. And somebody, um, I think before we started recording, I said, uh, did you take the test? And one student said they did, but they didn't know how to grade it. Um, well, you could grade it by simply going through the notes and looking up all the answers, and then you would know what the correct answers are. 
but I will simply take a photo with my phone and then um, I will email that photo to all your parents and then they'll have the answers to the test. So I can do that. Uh, let's see, should we start of this? Uh, yeah, we've got, we've got a little time. We'll start lesson number 11 and just see how far we get. Uh, number one, many of the precise definitions regarding the nature of God, particularly the nature of Christ, were adopted in response to incorrect understandings which threatened the orthodox belief of the early church. A lot of our teachings as Catholics had to be explicitly defined and written down because somebody was getting it wrong. Jesus came to the world. He revealed himself to the apostles, and the apostles gave us that divine revelation. And as long as the apostles were alive, if somebody was thinking and speaking incorrectly about Jesus, the apostles could correct it. Uh, that was simple. But what happens after all the apostles have died? You can't go to Jerusalem and talk to Peter or talk to John and say, what's the correct thing here? They're all gone. But the apostles ordained other men to take their place. We call those men bishops. And the person who takes the place of Peter is called the Pope. He's the head of the apostles. He's the head of the bishops. And so in the early centuries after the apostles were gone, the bishops had to teach the faith and make sure that everybody understood it correctly. And oh, that is a problem, kids even when the apostles were alive. There were tons of people who were getting it wrong. They did not understand who Jesus was. They didn't understand what Jesus was. Some people thought Jesus was an angel. Some people thought Jesus was only a human being. Some people thought Jesus was only God and not a human being. Some people thought he was just an apparition. That, that he wasn't a real human being at all. He was like a ghost who only pretended to be a human being. <laughs> people... People, some people didn't think he actually suffered and died on the cross. They said, no, no, that was a big fake out. He, he was, he was a, a spirit who made himself look like a human, and he just made himself look like he was bleeding, but he didn't actually bleed because he wasn't actually real. <laughs> there were all kinds of beliefs, and the apostles had to keep correcting every time one of these crazy ideas came up, the apostles had to keep correcting it. And when the apostles were gone, the bishops had to correct it. And so if you're the bishop of Jerusalem, you're correcting people in your area. And if you're the bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, well, you're correcting people in your area. And if you're the Bishop of Rome, you've got your area. And, but you see, they didn't have modern means of communication. They didn't have telephones or computers or anything like that. And so it could get very confusing. For example, what books, we talked about this earlier, what the canon of scripture, 
which books should be considered inspired by God? Well, the Bishop of Antioch had a list. The Bishop of Alexandria had a list. The Bishop of Jerusalem had a list. Bishop of Rome had a list. They didn't all have the same list. They had some differences. And that's why after several centuries, they had to get together and make one list so that all Christians, all followers of Christ, all the members of the church were following the same scriptures. And this is how the Nicene Creed comes about. You've got this priest named Arius in Egypt, and he's got some misconceptions about Jesus. And he's a very good teacher. He is telling everybody these errors, and people are believing him. And I don't know the, the tune, but history says that he even put his teachings into some songs. And the songs became very popular. And so people are singing songs, and the song is telling them the wrong thing about Jesus. The song is telling them that Jesus was a creature. Jesus was not a creature. He was not made by God. Jesus is God. And in the creed, we say, through him, all things were made. That was put into the creed by the bishops because Arius was saying that Jesus was not God and he was not the creator. So the bishops make it very clear. This is how this process, somebody teaches the wrong thing, and so the bishops have to get together and teach the correct thing, and they write it down for everybody to see and everybody to learn. That's how we get the Nicene Creed. Well, there's my grandson, Jack. Finally, the picture came through. You just popped onto my screen. I clicked stop video, and then I clicked start it again. I was just like, well, let's see if that does anything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, here well, I am. Good to see you, Jack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, have we done number two yet? Question number two. Uh, on lesson 11? We have not done two yet. Okay. Um, but we can do that right now. Number two, many bishops and leaders in the early church fought tirelessly against false teachings about God. St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, that was a very important city in Egypt right at the mouth of the Nile River, where the Nile River dumps into the Mediterranean Sea, is the, is the uh, city of Alexandria, Egypt. Did you know the biggest library in the world was there at one time? It was a center of learning. Was it the Vatican Library? Oh, the Vatican didn't even hardly, didn't even exist yet when the, when the library at Alexandria was there. St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, was one of the great defenders of the faith against the Arian heresy. And I just mentioned the Arian heresy is named after a priest named Arius, who got a lot of things wrong about Jesus. And so um, they had a council in 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea. And at that council, uh, St. Athanasius, Bishop Athanasius. He was one of the main defenders of the true faith. And uh, he paid a price. Some of the Roman emperors did not agree with him. Some of the Roman emperors were Arians. They thought Arius was right. And... Um, they kicked Athanasius out of his 
job as bishop of Alexandria, Egypt. He was exiled. He actually had to leave the city. And sometimes he was hunted down to be arrested. Over the course of his life, I think he was exiled from Alexandria four different times. <laughs> he, he really had to suffer. Was he martyred? Uh, no, I do not think Athanasius was martyred. But he did suffer quite a lot for teaching the truth. And he was one of the main spokespersons at the Council of Nicaea. And uh, by the way, and uh, maybe we'll finish with this. It's just a fun tidbit. You've all heard of Santa Claus. Well, Santa Claus is named St. Nicholas. That's, that's what Santa Claus means, St. Nicholas. And at the Council of Nicaea, there was a bishop. Was he Bishop of Smyrna or Bishop of Myra? I think it was Bishop of a town called Myra. And um, he, uh, he was one of the bishops at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And uh, they say he was so mad at Arius because Arius was teaching the wrong thing that he, that he got so mad that he just walked over and smacked him. He punched him out. And uh, the other bishop said, no, no, Nicholas, you can't do that. You can't do that. And they suspended Nicholas. I think he wasn't allowed to come to the meeting for like three days. And... Uh, so good old Santa Claus, he had a temper. He punched out Arius uh, at the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> so um, yep, that's Arius was pretty naughty, getting cold. <laughs> good job, St. Nicholas. <laughs> that's funny. Well, kids, we'll, we'll, we'll end there, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do next week, but we'll pray first. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you are like our Papa. And we pray that in our life, we will live as good children who love their Father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going, Thank to you. Shut, Thank you. I'm going to shut my recording off and then I'll just say a word. Thanks. I'll say a word to you after I shut my recording off. Thank Bye. you.